All right, so we've been doing this series and uh, on One Year to Live, where we anticipate and said, what if this was our last year? Our last year of life, would we live differently than we do as if we had, if we thought we had plenty of years left? And maybe in some really important ways we might. And we broke it into different sections. And so we are finishing off one section today on living passionately. And I think to really talk about living passionately in the way that God would have for us, we need to ask a question. And so I'm going to ask this question this morning. I'm going to give you the whole point way up front give you the, and not bury the lead at all, and ask simply, is it perhaps time to give up? Now, when I say that, I, I realize that's not what we teach our kids, right? We, th we think it's very important when they're children to make sure they stick it out, even if it's uncomfortable, do things a little bit longer, live up to your commitments, continue to, to try, don't give up too quickly, that sometimes difficulty uh, doesn't necessarily mean you have to stop, but instead that you just barrel through it. I remember uh, Luke had started preschool. Uh, this was, what, a couple weeks ago. And, and no, he, he was very young, and he, he wanted to go, or at least he thought we found a preschool in the area. And he went there, and he, and he hated it. He hated it. And, and it's like, well, we don't, you don't have to go. Like, that's it's not required, but why not, you know, uh, and he says, I just, I don't want to do it. I'd rather be home with mom. And I said, I get that. I get that. But, you know, we paid for the month. So can you stick it out? You know, he had like another week left or something. And we did that. Why? Not because we really had to get our money's worth or any of that kind of stuff. But it, apart from just saying just it, based on a whim, we didn't want him based on whims to just give up. And so try it out. And sure enough, he, he was done. And we were proud of him for doing that, but we teach kids that, but, and, and it's such a part of us, you know, this whole idea of winners never quit and quitters never win. It's such ingrained in our culture that when I ask if it's maybe time to give up, I feel like I need to convince you a little bit. So I'm going to convince you this morning. I'm going to try by bringing you through someone else's faith journey, specifically that of Simon Peter. It's a familiar story. I, I, I write down on your uh, outline, I write Simon Peter. For those of you who don't recall, you know, his name was Simon, and Jesus later changed his name to Peter because that's in Greek, Petra, it's the, it's the word for rock, and he says, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And so he has two different names, and so I'll probably go back and forth between them. I'm not being really consistent. Uh, but it's a familiar story, and I, I really want to get you in there. So let's just start with Matthew 26 and look at this passage specifically. This is, this is starting in, uh, during the, the Last Supper, right? Uh, as uh, Jesus is talking to him, giving him final things. I, I don't, they don't have a sense. They don't necessarily know that it's the last night. But Jesus told them, This very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Now, I have to tell you, I, I think that's a beautiful sentiment, isn't it? I mean, it's beautiful for him to say that, that, no, Jesus, I am all in. I have made this commitment. I am all for you. No matter what comes in this future, I am here. I am with you. Count me in. Thick or thin, I am here. Based, he's, he's doing this based on what he knows. I mean, this isn't just a whimsical fly by night. Oh, let's try out Jesus for a while. He has had just tremendous experiences and many opportunities to really live that out. Maybe you recall that uh, Peter started off, you know, uh, coming to Jesus because he witnessed this miracle of fish. Right? He was out fishing. He couldn't find anything for all night. He had worked all night. And Jesus came and said, well, just do it this way. And, and Peter said, okay. And they bring in so much fish that the boats nearly sink. And immediately he goes to Jesus. I want to follow you. I'm after you. And, and, and he began in just in bold ways. We talked a couple of weeks ago. A few, maybe, well, we missed last week. So a few weeks back. 
where Jesus uh, was walking on water and Peter, Simon was the one who walked out onto the water with him, willing to, as, as a matter of faith. And he even said to Jesus, if you call me, I will come out. And Jesus called him and he walked on water. He had this opportunity, this chance. He had, he had seen the miracles of Jesus. He had seen so much going on. He had seen God at work. It was Simon who said of Jesus, you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, you know, the Father has shown you that. So he's seeing God at work. God's at work in his life. He's seeing the miracles of Jesus. He is so in. He has given up his life, or at this point, to follow Jesus. To, he's given up fishermen uh, while fishing for fish because Jesus said, literally, I'm going to have you fish for men. He has changed his life around. He is following him. He has been devoting himself to Jesus and the leadership even. Uh, Jesus had had him, among others, get ready for this Passover dinner. He was involved in all these kind of things. And isn't that what we really do? Ultimately, isn't that what we want out of each and every one of us? This idea that you and I, and I know many of you have made a commitment very similar to Jesus, saying even if everybody else, even if I'm the only one standing, I am willing to follow you. Because, of course, had in your worship folder a couple weeks ago the idea that starts with faith, so I'm going to just add it again, of course, and this is the blank, first blank in your outline, of course we start with faith. That's exactly how we start with God. We have to start with faith. Hebrews defines faith this way. And without, well, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and then rewards those who earnestly seek him. That we, that we go into this idea of going to Jesus. We, we believe that God exists. We want to please God. We can only do that through faith by making that commitment, among other things, that says, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to move forward. I look to an unknown future, and I promise you, Jesus, I'm going to be on your side. That's what we long for, and I think that's what Peter's saying here. Peter is saying... Jesus, no, no, I, I, I am with you. I am with you. Like I said, I know many of you here have made that kind of commitment. I have multiple times. There are multiple times where I have to recommit, where I go to the Lord and say, okay, I'm here, Jesus, whatever it takes. But look at Jesus' response. Again, for many of you, this isn't a surprise, but Jesus responds with, Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, This very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, why did Jesus say this? Now, for those of you who know the story, Peter did, in fact, deny him three times. After he had scattered, uh, he was confronted multiple times. Hey, weren't you with Jesus? Didn't I see you with him? Aren't you with him? And he says, I've never known the man. I don't know who you're talking about. No. And he did indeed deny him three times. So Jesus is obviously telling the truth. But why did Jesus bother saying this at all? As opposed to just saying, yeah, yeah okay, Peter, we'll see. That he confronts Peter and says, no, you are going. Why did he even bother saying it? And I figure there's at least a couple of reasons. Because I, I, I believe in some part, you know, we'll see works. I remember having somebody uh, who was a member here at Linwood who had decided he was going to go and do this new venture and this huge pyramid scheme with groceries. And he... he sat me down. He says, I need to talk to you, Pastor Bill. Look at this and how you can become so wealthy and you can do this and just sign up and be a part of this. And, and I said, you know, I politely declined, but I remember at the moment, like I didn't feel it was on me to sit there and go, you are going to crash. But instead to just go, okay, we'll see. When he said, no, this is great, this is the best thing ever, okay, we'll see. 
But that's not what Jesus does. And I, I guess there's a couple of reasons. One, I think in part, he's trying to mark the moment. He's trying to, to center down and saying, Peter, I want you to remember this moment. You said you will never fall away, and I'm telling you, you will. And, and I think they're marking that moment for, you know, maybe for our benefit, so we can make the connection uh, when he is indeed, dis, he disowns Jesus three times. For those of you who know, and we'll look at this in a bit, uh, there in John, he's going to mark it again. He's going to give it, Jesus, uh, Peter is going to be given a chance by Jesus to declare that he indeed wants to follow him three different times, that he loves him, but he wants to mark the moment. I remember doing that with someone who, and they, uh, I was talking to a young couple right before they were getting married, and, and I suggested to them, and I said, you know, one of the things I really think is helpful is, is for you to come up with a budget. I think it's helpful to have a budget, not just for your wedding, but for your life, that, that you think about, you know, your, your inflow of money and where you're going to spend that, and you spend that where, according to your values, and, and just define all that. And, the, and this person said, yeah, no, I hate those things. They're so restrictive. And I said, well, actually, my experience has been just the opposite, that if, if you plan on where it goes, it can be really freeing. I'm like, no, I just don't buy it. And I remember saying to this couple, I, I said, will you just do me a favor then? As best as you can, will you cement this moment in your mind? Just remember this moment, because I'm going to ask you in about five, ten years what I possibly could have said at this point to convince you. Because I've got a sneaking suspicion you'll you'll change your mind. And I think Jesus is doing that kind of thing. Like he's, he's, he's telling Peter, uh, you know, I, I, I want you to remember this moment. This is, this is important. But there's another factor as well. He directly is contradicting Jesus. I mean, Jesus was the one who brought up, remember, uh, Jesus brought up, he said, this very night you will all fall away. Okay, the scripture says that it's going to happen. And Peter's like, no. Peter says, no, I'm not going to do it. Not me, even if everyone else fails. And Jesus said, no, 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 you, you will. I, I am telling you the truth. You, you, don't you know me? Like, when have I spoken falsely? And he says, I do it. And Peter declares again, well, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Now, Jesus didn't, Jesus seemed to be okay at that point to go, okay, we'll see. He doesn't confront him, but Peter is willing to stand up. And why does he do that? Why is Peter so about saying, no, 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 you don't understand, Jesus. I am all in. I have made this commitment. I am with you. And even if you tell me that that's not always going to be true, I am telling you it is true. Jesus, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, sweet Jesus. Don't worry your pretty little head. I'm going to stay with you. And I think it centers in on the fact that Peter was all about being in control. You see, he knew what it meant to follow Jesus. Remember, he was the one that said Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah, and he knew exactly what that meant. He had been taught since birth what it meant to have a Messiah. You see, for the Jews of the time, they knew five things about the Messiah. And they expected five very specific things. One, that he would come from the line of David. He would be a king from David's line. Secondly, that, that he would rule Israel. That the Messiah would be in charge of all of Israel. Third, that, that he would gather the Jews together under one umbrella. And in fact, he would restore, number four, he would restore observance of the Torah. And so really that the law would become important again and restore all that. And then ultimately at five, to bring peace to the world. So a Jew of his day, Peter, like probably many other Jews of the time, knew exactly what that meant. That meant Jesus was going to overthrow Rome. Rome was oppressing them. Rome ruled over Israel. Rome had, was oppressing the Jews. They were ready for someone to come and finally take on Rome. And Peter knew it could happen. He had seen Jesus do so many amazing things that, that, that he could just 
seemingly produce food from nowhere that he could heal those who were otherwise hurt. He knew what it was going to look like. Rome needed to topple. Rome is the problem. Rome is messing everything up, and we need to do something about that. And here comes Jesus, powerful, amazing, the Messiah who can command storms. And he will help us. It, it doesn't matter that we just have a few of us with us. It doesn't matter if it's just 12 or, you know, sometimes larger groups. But it will be enough because Jesus is enough. And I know he can overthrow Rome. He was ready. Simon was ready for absolutely anything. He was prepared. He was prepared to stand there with Jesus and pull out his little sword and be able to take on the world, just him and Jesus, and they were going to overthrow Rome. He was prepared for anything except this. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. This is later. Um... This is later after the garden. This is later after this is, well, when the betrayal happens, right? With them was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. And now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. The man stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. This is the moment. This is the moment that Peter has been waiting for. This is the moment that Simon knew. This is a day. They have, they've got a group of guards and soldiers ready with weapons to finally take it. Here's where we take our stand. Here's what we do. We, just a ragtag bunch of group, but we're going to be fine because we are followers of Jesus. We're going to take control. We are going to win. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword. Now, this is uh, the passage in Matthew. and John, it tells us that that was Peter. I'm not sure why Matthew decides to not throw Peter under the bus, but for whatever reason, he doesn't. Just, oh, just one of them. But it was Peter that does that. And he says, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. He just went in. I'm going to attack. I'm going to defend Jesus. I'm going to help overthrow Rome with the Messiah and God's own. But then Jesus said, put your sword back in its place. Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Jesus is saying, that's not what I'm talking about. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he'll once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But then how would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? You see, Simon was ready for anything. Except for Jesus to have his own agenda. He wasn't ready for Jesus to do it his way. For Jesus to have a plan that was different than Simon's. I say this because I honestly believe that this is where so many Christians struggle. And if you're here this morning, you're not a Christian. And, and you say, well, you know, I hear Christians talk about power and I hear about God doing amazing things and, and I don't see that happening. I wonder how much of that is true because of this aspect that we have Christians that are set with their own agendas, that they, not, not selfish any more than Peter's was selfish. Peter wasn't, it wasn't all about him. He was ready for all the Jews, for the kingdom of God. He was ready to go fight for Rome or fight against Rome. He was ready. It wasn't selfish. And, and we, too, our, our dreams, our agendas might not be selfish. We, we want to see good things happen, things for other people. And yet we have our own agenda and our own plan. And... The next point in your outline. Our agenda will finally get us to the place that Jesus betrays us. You see, from Simon's perspective, Jesus betrayed him. He knew God's plan. God's plan was to rule Israel. God's plan was to bring peace. God's plan was to 
restore the observance of, of the Bible. He, he knew God's plan, and he knew how that was going to happen, and he knew he was going to be at the forefront, and he knew all these things. Even if he were to die in the process, he was willing to fight. Even if he wasn't going to see it happen, he was willing to do whatever it took to be a part of it. And then Jesus said, no. You know, when we initially seek Jesus, every one of us, I mean, that's kind of what Hebrews 11 hinted at, right? Know that he will reward us is that we often come to Jesus initially because we seek something. And what we really seek is we want healing and we want miracles. We have a problem in our lives and we want Jesus to fix. And we, we're pretty clear what he needs to fix. It's usually, you know, this other person in our lives. Or maybe some hold that something has on my life or something. And, and, I, and I need Jesus to fix that. And, and the thing is, is it's not necessarily inaccurate. Sometimes Jesus is like, yeah, I agree. We need to deal with this. And, and I'm going to bring that into your life and we're going we're gonna to handle that. But it, inevitably, at some point, even if we agree with God to begin with, it gets to a point where God seems to have a different agenda and it's no longer about just giving us the healing and the miracles that we think we want. And instead, he starts meddling in our lives. That he seems to have a different agenda. And what do we do with that? And that can look a whole bunch of different ways. And let me give you one example, right? You've been praying. You've been reading scripture. You've been going to church. You've been longing for this something miraculous to happen. You want your burning bush experience. You want your... God passing in front of the crevice. You want the sense of something miraculous and big. And then it, day after day, and it doesn't happen. And you say, what's the point? What's the point? Things are still hard. I still hurt. God isn't showing up. Or maybe, maybe you have a dream. A kingdom-sized dream like... Peter had. And, and, and you've been investing. You've been giving your time. You've been giving your abilities and talents. You've been giving your money. You've been ways and just investing and investing in dreams. You want to see Portland come to Jesus. And you've been sharing the gospel. And you've been giving so that others could. And you've been trying. And you long for that. And you see it and, and over and over. And you see that less and less folks in the Portland area are going to church. Less and less are committing to Jesus, and do you sit there and go, just what a waste. What a waste. Why did I bother? Or maybe another scenario. You look at your life, and you're not very pleased with where it is, and you're trying hard. You're struggling in your relationships. Your job doesn't seem to be going too many places. Your bills are hard, and then some disaster strikes. And can't help but think Jesus has betrayed you. Just like Simon. So what do we do with that? Well, one thing we can do is we can hide. I mean, that's ultimately what Peter did. Right? By denying over and over. He scattered. He took off. He let things happen. He just, he's going to hide. He's just going to hide. We can do that. We can just hide. We can say, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of done with this Jesus guy. I'm done with this. I, 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 I'm just, I'm going to run and hide. And that hiding may not look like it did with Simon. It may not look like you're literally being questioned on the side of the road about whether you know Jesus. Maybe it looks instead like, I mean, we all know people like this, where you have somebody who was heavily involved in church and they were they had seemed to have made a commitment to Jesus and then and then they later just say, you know what? Yeah, I've just I, I started researching on the internet and then I'm just all done with it. I'm all educated now. And I realize that it's all just wrong. Now the truth is is there are people who have legitimate questions. And I think we need to honor those questions. And, and I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who say they have now learned, but never really bothered asking somebody who believed, never really talking to somebody who could challenge these things they're learning on the internet. 
They're hiding behind a smoke screen of a bunch of really bright people who put really great YouTube videos together and saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm hiding this way on this pedestal of being so much smarter than you rubes. Or maybe we hide in the sense of, you know, I was going to church, but man, those people, just they just didn't do enough. They weren't motivated enough. They didn't do enough for me. I'm not getting what I need. One of my favorite stories, I remember a buddy of mine, Tom, I was went back to Kansas uh, for a vacation and saw him and, and asked him about the church that I, he'd become a Christian in, that I had brought him to when we were youth together. And he goes, nah, I'm done. You know, I left that church and I was gone for nine months and nobody even came after me. I'm like, wait, your complaint is that they didn't chase you after you already decided to leave? I'm like, I, I remember doing that too, but I was seven at the time. But, but just that idea of like, what's enough? Like, they, they, those people, they're not good enough. They're not smart enough. Like, they're not really doing what God wants. And I want to do what God wants, so I'm just going to back away. That's another way we can hide. Another, a third way we can hide is just say, well, I'll just stay in the same place and I'll do the same thing, but I'm just giving up. I'm just going to sit over to the side and I'm just tired and I'll just watch the world go wherever it's going to go and wonder why it's in a handbasket as it does. Come on, somebody got that reference, right? Okay. I just... Which is ironic, right? Because I said, I asked, maybe it's time to give up, but doesn't that sound like giving up? But I think there's another option besides hiding, and that is we can give up. And what I mean by this specifically is we give up controlling the outcomes. We give up on claiming our agenda is everything we must do. That we give up equating what we're trying to do with what God wants. Now, it doesn't mean we're not doing anything. Maybe we're working hard. Maybe we've set a course of agenda, but that we always take this humility like God's going to do what he's going to do. I mean, one of my favorite examples is Abraham Lincoln, who, who said at one point as he's dealing with this, he goes, the will of God prevails. In great contest, each party claims to act in accordance with the will of God. Both may be, and one must be, wrong. They could both be wrong, but at least one of them is. He says, so somebody's got to be wrong here, because God cannot be for and against the same thing at the same time. And in the present civil war, it's quite possible that God's purpose is something different from the purpose of either party. See, so anytime something's going on and you're struggling and you're trying and you feel like there's opposition to it and, and, and yet you're trying to do what you think is good. And certainly Lincoln tried to do that and at least as best as we can tell. And, and yet being willing in the midst of this going, look, I, I, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to try, but I, I am going to my goal is not to make sure God's on my side. The goal is for me to be on the side of God. That's what I long for. And that's ultimately, maybe what that means is for you and I to give up a little bit. Our agenda, our control that just says, you know what? It's got to look like the way I think it's going to look. Success looks like this. God must be wanting this. And if, and if those people aren't doing it, or that place isn't doing it, or God himself isn't doing it, that isn't a betrayal as much as maybe, maybe I'm just going to learn something new here. And I think for some of us, if we're willing to give up that control, that Jesus will be saying, finally, finally, you're ready to follow. I told you I, I would look at that part where in, in the end of John where Jesus redeems Peter. And I think there's something really amazing in what happens. And so you need to hear the end of the story because I think this is your story and this is my story. If we're willing to give up the, our own agendas and just be faithful to follow Jesus as best as we can, look what happens. Maybe I shouldn't bring it like that. Let me just go into the passage. When they had finished eating, this is uh, during one of Jesus' resurrection appearances. When they had finished eating... 
Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Well, yes, Lord. He said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. He didn't say overthrow Rome. He didn't say control all of life. He didn't even say, just, just, just take care of my people. That's what I want you to do. Just, just, just do that. Just do what's in front of you. Do the ministry in front of you to care for those that you can. And again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. I don't think he's saying anything different. He's saying the same thing. Really, I, do you love me? Yep. Do what's in front of you. Just do the ministry in front of you. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. You didn't believe me the first two times? And G, I almost get a sense of Jesus going, I didn't believe your denials the first three times. I didn't believe that you were willing to get rid of me forever. For as many times as you said you don't want me, you're going to turn around and say just as many times that you love me. Do you love me, he said? Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And now, that, that'd be enough, right? He's willing to redeem him. He's willing to do it. And I think Jesus, if we're willing to give up, he says that. But notice these verses that I think we often skip over. Right after, he says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. What does that mean? I don't know. But Jesus seems to explain it as he says, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, there's some tradition around how Peter died, that he was crucified on a cross, upside down, all this kind of stuff, but catch this. When Jesus said to him, follow me, you realize what Peter longed for. Jesus, even if everyone falls away, I will die for you. And Jesus says, yeah, but not on your terms, on mine. I just want you to do this. Follow me. Are you willing to follow Jesus? Let's pray. Glorious God. I, I, I don't know what it is about wanting to control the outcomes. Because control is a myth. I can't control things. I can't, I can't get my neighbors to, to can't force them to fall in love with you. I can't have all the spiritual growth in, in the people's lives that I care about just automatically happen? Like, what am I controlling? I, I can't control anything. I, I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I can't control the safety of, of, of my family. I can't control so much in this world. There's so much that's just beyond my control. And, and yet, I feel I hold on so tightly that it just slips. It slips through my fingers. And I'm white-knuckled, and I'm struggling, and I just need to say, Lord, I give up. I give up control, and I give it to you. I know, I know you had it anyway, but to think that if it doesn't turn out the way I want, that you somehow betrayed me? No, I give it to you. And really, Lord, if I'm willing to be really honest, I can't even control myself. And I so desperately just need you. So I give up trying to be boss of the universe. Give it over to you, my Savior and my God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.